Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, we bless you and we thank you. We thank you, Father, for this time of being able to go into your word. Father, we pray right now that you bless this time, that you would illuminate the text. Help us to understand what your word is saying to our lives, O oh God. For Father, we pray right now as we go into your word that you open our hearts, that you open our minds, help us to hear what the word is saying to us, O oh God. And Father, we pray that you would speak to me and through me. Let your people not hear me, but you who dwell within me. We thank you and we bless your holy and righteous name. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. Please sit. And so we are in our sermon series, which is entitled Blessed. And we're in part number five, which is entitled Blessed People Show Mercy. Blessed people show mercy. And we're making our way through the beginning portion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, which is known as the Beatitudes, so that we can get a better understanding of what is God entitled to and bless us? What is God able to bless us with and what is God going to bless us when we live a certain way? What kind of life would God bless? And we find out in the Beatitudes, the life that God blesses is life that people are poor in spirit, a, a life where people mourn, and a life where people who have uh, meekness in their lives, a life where they are seeking to do all that God has called them to do. And we find out that there are eight Beatitudes in total. We've looked at the first four of those Beatitudes, and those first four Beatitudes, they, they make us to look inside, to look at ourselves, to look at our motives, to, to look at our hearts, to see why we're doing what we're doing. The last four of the Beatitudes make us to look outside of ourselves to see how are we treating people. How are we interacting with one another? And we find ourselves with the first of the last four of the Beatitudes, which is the fifth one, which is blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. The Bible talks a lot about mercy. Matter of fact, there's over 150 references to being merciful or having mercy. And most of those references go back to God as God being the one who's merciful, as God being the one who has mercy. And when you begin to think about the scriptures, how often God says he has mercy, like Psalm 86 and 15, which says, you, O Lord, are a God full of compassion and graciousness long-suffering and abundant in mercy and truth. Then in Ephesians 2, 4, and 5, which says, But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you are saved. And so when I begin to think about the mercy of God, and I begin to think about the scriptures of God, there's, there's two primary ways that God shows us his mercy. The first one is how he sustains us, how he keeps us, and, and how he is there for us to aid us, even though we can't do anything to repay him for what he's done. How he comes in and sees about us to, to make sure our lives are running well, even though we can't do nothing for him in return. And then secondly, the second way he shows us mercy is that he forgives us of our many, many sins. He forgives us of our trespasses against him, our offenses, our offenses to him. He forgives us even though he doesn't have to. He forgives us because he chooses to forgive us. And when I begin to think about the mercy of God, I begin to think, am I merciful? I believe that's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. Am I merciful? Am, am I a, a person who, who shows mercy because I want a life that God will bless? And, and blessed are those who are what? Merciful. And so I want a life that God will bless with, with heavenly joy and divine happiness that I can have this no matter what's happening in my life. Can I be like that? And so when I look at the fifth beatitude, the scripture moves me to want to be merciful. Do you want to be merciful? It, it, it moves me to not only wanting to be merciful, it, it moves me to say I need to act in merciful ways towards people. 
to where the scripture not just, not just compels us, motivates us, Jesus also commands us to be merciful. Luke 6, 36, he says, be merciful just as your father also is merciful. So which tells me now that, that being merciful is not just a good idea, it's a commandment from God. It's not just something good that I should do, it is Jesus saying this is something I must do. Remember now, how, how is God merciful? He, he, he helps those who can't help him, and he forgives those even though he doesn't have to forgive. And so being merciful is to treat people the way God treats people. I really like how one author says, or how he defines mercy. He says, mercy is compassion in action. It is compassion in action. When you are merciful, not only do you feel compassion towards people, that compassion moves you to do something for those people. Mercy is not just a, a good feeling on the inside. It's not just compassion or an attitude on the inside. It is compassion that moves you to help folk, even though they may not be able to help you. It, it is compassion to where it moves you to help people in your everyday life. Mercy is when we have compassion on people who, who needs help, but they can't help us. So to help us to understand this, we're going to look at two parables of Jesus and, and one encounter Jesus has. So, so we can get a better understanding of what compassion really looks like. The first parable we're going to look at is, is the parable of the Good Samaritan. The parable of the Good Samaritan is an ideal picture of what compassion looks like, what mercy looks like. It's found in Luke chapter 10. And, and the parable Jesus talks about this Jewish man who who was coming down from Jerusalem and he's going to a city called Jericho and on his way down to Jericho he is robbed and beat half to death the Bible says that he's beat half to death and he's he's laying on the side of the road and and there's there's three men that that come and have an encounter with this Jewish man who's on the side of the road he he's got all his stuff taken away he's beat half to death and the Bible tells us what happens in these three encounters the first two people that encounter this man one is a priest and the other is a Levite so these men would have been respected in the community. These, these men would have known the word of God. These men would have known what to do and how to show compassion to people who have been hurt. But the Bible says that these two men, the priest and the Levite, they crossed the street and walked past a man. And then all of a sudden, that third person comes. This third person, he is a Samaritan, a Samaritan. This person, he would be half Jewish and half Gentile, this, this Samaritan. The Jews didn't like the Samaritans, and Samaritans didn't like the, the Jews. Matter of fact, dislike is too nice of a word. They hated one another. And yet when this Samaritan saw the Jewish man beaten on the ground, the Bible says that he is moved with compassion towards this man. And the Samaritan, he goes and he cleans the man up. He, he, he cleans him, he, he bandages up his wounds, and then he takes his own money and puts him into a hotel, and he stays overnight with the man. The next morning, the Bible says, he gets up and he goes to the innkeeper, and he tells the innkeeper, look, I'm going to give you some more money, but if he charges anything else up while I'm gone, when I get back, I'm going to pay the rest of the bill. The Samaritan, he had compassion. But he didn't just feel bad for the man. His compassion moved him to do something for the man. To where in a normal situation, these two men would have hated each other. In a normal situation, they wouldn't even have been around one another. Matter of fact, the Jews used to walk around Samaria just to get to the other side of it. But this man, this Samaritan, he, he put his hatred aside. He put his dislike aside because he was moved with compassion and he did something for that man. That is mercy. How do you respond to people on a daily basis? How do you respond to people who you see in crisis? 
and who's going through things in their lives. I guess my first question should be before that question is, do you have compassion for anybody? That's where we should start. Do you have compassion for anyone? And for those who you do have compassion for, what do you do with that compassion? Do you say, well, you know that really ain't my business. So I'm going to just leave that alone. I feel bad for them, but, but I'm going to just get out of that situation because that has nothing to do with me. Or does your compassion move you to help them even if it's just a little bit? Does it move you to do something for them? And you may be thinking, well, listen here, Pastor. You know, that's, there's a lot of people who need compassion. There's a, there's a lot of people who who going through stuff and who needs my help and, and I can't help everybody. We're not asking you to help everybody. I'm asking you when you see somebody who you meet, do you help? Someone who, who breaks your heart, do you help? No, 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 not, not everybody. But the ones you meet throughout your day and you can help and it has touched your heart, do you do anything for them? Well, you may say, Pastor, I ain't got no money. I'm not asking you if you have money. I'm asking you, do you have compassion? It's not about money. It's about what do you do when compassion breaks your heart? Do you do something to help that person who has broke your heart? Because you see they're in this situation. The call to mercy is not that one individual person helps everybody. The call to mercy is to say when that person who you see in a normal day and they need help and it touches your heart, do you do something? The real question is how do you help people? Remember, mercy is compassion in action. The second parable we're going to look at is, 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 is a parable that Jesus talks about the unmerciful steward. Matthew chapter 18 to where Jesus tells us how there's this king, he, he is ready to settle his accounts with all of his stewards, with, with all of his servants. He, he, he calls them all in to, to settle their accounts. And, and there's one steward who comes up to the king and he doesn't have the money to repay his, his debt. So, so, the, so the Bible says that the king commands that the man be sent to jail to, 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 to sell his wife, to sell his kids, to sell all their stuff, and so that the, the debt can be repaid. Sell them all off. The Bible says, Jesus says in the parable how the man, he falls on the ground and he begins to beg the king. He begins to beg for patience and, and beg for time to, to repay his, his debt. And the Bible says how the king is moved with compassion. So, remember now, mercy is compassion to action. He is moved with compassion and he releases the man. And he forgives their debt. The man receives mercy. The king did not have to forgive the debt. Matter of fact, he was owed the debt. But he was moved with compassion. So he says, you know what? I'm going to let you go free. Your wife go free. Your kids go free. You can keep your stuff. And you know what? You can keep your money. It's all right. But the same man who was forgiven, the Bible says he goes out and finds someone. Not stumbles into someone. He goes out looking for someone who owes him money and he demands to be paid for his stuff. He finds him and the Bible says, the man says, listen, I ain't got your money, man. So the forgiven man, the forgiven man, the forgiven servant, the Bible says he grabs him by his throat and says, pay me what you owe. And this is the same man who, this man who's now being almost choked, right? Half to death, right? He falls on the ground and he begins to beg for patience. He begins to beg for time to repay. And this forgiven man, right? The forgiven servant tells the man who owes him money, he says, no. Put him in jail. Until he can pay off what he owes me, put him in jail. 
And the Bible says that, that, that some servant for her, the servants of the king, overheard what was happening to the man who has just been forgiven and been given compassion. He goes out now and he does this to this man so they go back and run and tell the king. And then the king calls this man in for judgment. He says, listen, listen, he says, you wicked servant. Why didn't you have compassion on the man since you have received compassion? Why don't you do to other people what you have been given? If you've been forgiven, why don't you forgive? If you have received compassion, why don't you have compassion? If you receive mercy, why don't you give mercy? You wicked servant. Listen to what he, Jesus says at the end of the parable. He says, he says, so my father, my heavenly father also will do to you, each of you, from your, if you don't from your heart, does not forgive his brother his trespasses. So therefore it tells me, right, that, 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 that mercy also is not just having um, to where you help people who need help, but mercy is also when you forgive people who hurt you. To where you forgive people who, in actuality, who you really don't have to forgive, but you choose to forgive because you've received mercy. Since I've been forgiven, I need to forgive. And to where merciful people understand, or people who have received mercy understand they need to be merciful. So merciful people don't hold grudges. Merciful people don't hang things over people's head and say, remember when you did this to me. Remember when you were acting like this towards me. They, they, they don't bring up in a conversation or in an argument what happened 10 years ago. You know, that happened a lot in marriages, right? Y'all sitting there, y'all, y'all arguing about ice cream. Next thing you know, somebody bring up something about their mama. Like, why you gotta talk about my mama? Right? Why she got something to do with this? Well, you remember when your mom did this lady? We was talking about ice cream. <laughs> we was just arguing over pecans, right? Or, 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 or just regular vanilla. Why you got to talk about my mama now? Right? I know she likes strawberry, but what that matter? They don't bring stuff up from the past. When you're merciful, you forgive because you have been forgiven. Merciful people understand the importance of forgiving people because they have been what? Forgiven. And they want to continue to be forgiven because they know in the future they're going to do something wrong to where they're going to want some forgiveness. And then the last portion of scripture we're going to look at is, is, is Jesus when he has fellowship with tax collectors. Uh, I really like this, this passage of scripture, right? This, this encounter what Jesus has with, with some tax collectors is Matthew chapter 9. Jesus, it is centered around Jesus calling a, a young man by the name of Matthew to be his disciple. A young man who, who was a tax collector. He calls him to be his disciple, and, and next thing you know, after he calls him to be his disciple, Matthew calls all his friends together to come to his house, right, for a party, and Jesus and his disciples are there. Matthew, the tax collector, tax collecting was a hated occupation by the Jews. Because usually it was a Jew who had this occupation of being a tax collector and they would go to other Jews and they would get rich off of ripping off other Jews. And however much they can get from these Jews, over what Rome wanted them to tax, it became theirs. So Jesus, first off, he calls one of these people to be his disciples to walk with him and to follow him and to learn from him. And then he goes to their house, scandalous. And he goes over to the house when there's a party, good God from glory. And this party with all these sinners and tax collectors probably got short skirts on and low pants on, all these people. 
And they're there, and Jesus is there. And it's interesting because there's these scribes and Pharisees there too. Ain't it interesting every time Jesus go around some people that other folks don't like, religious folks are there? Like, it's like religious folks say, listen, listen, why you at the club? I saw you at the club, which tells me you was at the club too. How do you know I was at the club unless you was at the club? Right? I mean, come on now. You wasn't just driving by. No, you wasn't. You was listening to it. Boom, chicka, chicka, boom, chicka, chicka. Yeah, you was there. You was there. All right, so, so, so Jesus is at the party. He's at the party, right? He's at the party. And, 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 and the Pharisees, they asked Jesus' disciples, they said, listen, um, why does your teacher, now these Pharisees have been listening to Jesus all this time, but now it is the disciples' teacher. Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? Why does Jesus associate with those people? Why, why does he spend time? time with those people? Why is he around those people? Why is he letting those kind of people know him? And why does he want to spend time to get to know them? Why? It's interesting, right? Because Jesus, he, he overhears the question. And listen to how he responds. He says, those who are well have no need of a physician but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says, listen, listen, y'all. Y'all, y'all, y'all getting all frustrated over something that should not be frustrating you. You, 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 are, you, are so, you are so concerned about sacrifices, right? To, to religious activity of which your heart is not in. You are concerned about that. Staying, staying pure when you're pure on the outside, but on the inside you're full of hell. You are all excited about that. But you're not excited about having mercy to people who want mercy. Jesus wanted to understand a part of his mission was to be around sick folks. Sick folks. Sick folk who know they sick. You know, you're around some sick folk and they like denying they sick. Like, like, oh, I ain't sick. <laughs> I ain't sick. You, you, you're, you're aching everywhere. I ain't sick. No, you sick. And get away from me for you get me sick. Right? Right? Jesus came to be around people who knew they were sick and wanted help. He said, I came to be around sinners, sinners, people who are sinners and they know they sinners. And they want help. He wants to get around them and spend time with them and get to know them and allow them to get to know him. Also, that he can show them what? Mercy. So that he can call them to repentance. Hence, mercy is calling folks to repent. A part of having compassion in action is getting around some people who don't know Jesus and telling them about Jesus. Showing them mercy by telling them, listen, God can and will forgive you of your sins. So therefore, introducing people to Jesus is an act of mercy. Helping them to understand who he is and what he has done for them is compassion in action. Spending time with them just like Jesus did so that they can get to know the God that you serve. It is so sad that some people are excited about going to heaven and their family's going to hell. But they okay. Because me and my kids, we gonna serve the Lord. But what about your cousins? What about your aunts and them? And your uncle? And your grandma? Nobody wanna see grandma and grandpa go to hell. God! 
But won't nobody go and talk to grandma and grandpa about Jesus and about repenting. So calling people to repentance and to salvation is an act of mercy. To give people what you have been given. Mercy. So therefore, when we are merciful, we do three things. We help people who cannot help us in return. We forgive people who have sinned against us. And we introduce people to Jesus and share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. And when we live like that, Jesus says in the Beatitudes, we will be blessed. We will have that joy that comes from heaven. Listen, when you forgive people, you stop yourself from being stressed. When you, when you just let it go and you forgive them, you stop yourself from having high blood pressure. You are blessed. You can stop taking them pills. Some people can get all mad to the dead. They just forgive their grandma. Forgive their parents. Forgive their siblings. You can be able to put the medicine down because what's causing your high blood pressure is not the chicken and the salt and the pork and beans and the sausage. It's not that. It's unforgiveness. It may be that too, but it's too. You ain't forgiving folks. You probably want to put that other stuff down too. You probably want to do that too. I had a moment, praise Jesus. So we got to forgive. Because when we forgive, we show mercy. When we forgive, we're being merciful. Because we understand that in order for us to continue to receive the mercy of God, we need to continue to be merciful to people. Because we know on the day of judgment, when we are standing before the mercy seat of Christ, we will need mercy. Look, I already know. When I see Jesus, listen, I'm going to be begging for mercy. I already know. Because I know there was things throughout my life, even as a follower of Jesus, even right now, that I have done things wrong, trespassed against him, offended his holiness, and on the day of judgment, I will be held accountable and I will ask for mercy. And since I need mercy then and now, I need, I must be merciful. To where, even if you're here today and you don't know Jesus, you too need mercy. You too need the mercy of God. And Jesus has extended that mercy to you by you hearing the gospel that he loves you so much that he shed his blood for you. He loves you so much, he was nailed to a cross for you. He loves you so much that he died for you. Being buried in a borrowed tomb, being dead for three days, and then coming back to life three days later. Also, you don't have to spend eternity in damnation. You can spend eternity with the Father. Therefore, giving you mercy, calling you to repentance, turning from a life of sin and turning unto God. Just asking for forgiveness. And mercy can be yours today. If you want to give your life to Jesus and receive that mercy, I just ask you to say a prayer with me. Let us bow. Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Father, I believe you sent Jesus. I believe he died on the cross. I believe he came back to life three days later. Jesus, I make you my Lord and my Savior. Now, Father, I pray for everyone under the sound of my voice. Father, I pray that you will help us to be merciful. I pray, oh God, 
that you will help us to have compassion in action. That when our hearts break for those on a normal, everyday basis, it will move us to do something to help. We thank you and we bless your holy and righteous name. And Jesus, the Christ, we pray. Amen. Come on, put your hands.